Right, I'd like to talk about WikiLeaks with, um, in terms of how they've, um, sort of how they've helped the anti-war community. It's not just the collateral murder video, and it's not just the 90,000 documented incidents in the Afghan war log um, that have thrown a light on the brutality of the wars in the 21st century. Um, but it's also the machinations um, exposed in the emails, the machinations of people in the State Department and their allies and their allies internationally um, to bring about war and deadly regime change. Uh, one such of these, uh, these Machiavellian emails is this one. Um, this is just the header from the email. It was written by Sir William Roebuck in 2006. He was the US ambassador to Damascus. Um, he's writing in this email, he's putting forward lots of suggestions um, as to how he could, as he puts it, throw a sad off balance. He's got lots of Machiavellian schemes about how to undermine the Assad regime, and including he's, he's decided, he states that they ought to stress um, Iranian influence in Syria, hoping to sort of engender a, a sectarian divide, which is a typical imperialist tactic. I'm talking about imperialism on trial. He was advocating this old, it's actually a, a British imperial <laughs> from the British Empire, divide and conquer, create, uh, create uh, a, a sectarian divide. So this email goes on, it's quite lengthy, and he's got all of these schemes which he's trying to impress people with. That was 2006. Um, what, we've, what I also particularly note about this email, which I, I find it's very useful that WikiLeaks has exposed this, is the recipient list. The recipients are the State Department, no, the Department of Treasury, Israel, Tel Aviv, the National Security Council, that's understandable. Secretary of State, that's understandable. The League of Arab, Na Arab States, supposedly understandable. US, US mission to the European Union in Brussels. The United Nations. Now that's what really um, resonated with me. The United Nations. The United Nations knew about this email in 2006 in which Roebuck was planning all of these schemes to destabilize the Syrian government. As I said, he, 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 puts, he uses the words, throw Assad off balance. So that was 2006. So when it, uh, why, first of all, why didn't an organization that was set up to be an honest arbiter in international relations with international law at its core, the United Nations, why didn't they pick this up as um, sort of preparations for war? Why didn't they flag this up? Even worse, five years later, when some of these mechanisms he was suggesting were being put into play, why didn't the United Nations say, oh, come on, you know, there's something wrong here. Um, you know, so there's, some there's some sort of um, nasty business going on. They didn't do that. Instead, um, they went along, very much went along with the rhetoric of um, peaceful protesters being uh, searching, you know, wanting democracy and freedom, being repressed by a brutal dictator. Uh, so th they went along with that. And even the Syrian ambassador to the UN, which is Bashar Jafari, he was excluded from UN sessions, which were discussing events in his own country. I mean, I find that really quite despicable. So I think we have to thank WikiLeaks not only for exposing the emails and the, and the thoughts of uh, the bad guys, but also exposing the collusion of some of the good guys. And we like to think the UN is a good guy, but I think they've colluded here. So thanks to WikiLeaks for that. Um, but reading... Um, <laughs> Um, but reading through this book, um, which I was bought, my, my husband bought me this for my birthday a few years ago, the WikiLeaks files, we can see that uh, many of the machinations for regime change um, are, are coincide um, with the targets of uh, the Washington neocons. Um, so if, if you look at the, the various regime changes that, that this book deals with, 
Um, they've, they've been stated quite openly by the Washington neocons. They made no secret about it. Uh, leading um, neocons like Richard Pearl, Michael D Ledeen, John Bolton, William Crystal, um, and others openly stated that they wanted to see regime change in Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Libya, Syria, and North Korea. So it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't a surprise. It was known. It was out there. Um, but again, when these things started to happen, nobody sort of, nobody in the media, in the international, uh, in, in government said, oh, look, you know, that, that's a bit strange that we're seeing this list played out in the 21st century exactly as described, as prescribed by the Washington neocons. Um, if you want to understand who the Washington neocons are, or neoconservatives is the full name, um, I, can't, I really recommend that you watch a BBC Panorama program from 2003 called The War Party. It's, it's practically unheard of for me to recommend anything from the BBC, but that is an excellent documentary. And it speaks to people um, in, in 2003, actually interviews the neoconservatives in Washington. They have an ideology, they say, of spreading democracy and freedom, but that demo particularly in the Middle East, but that democracy and freedom has, um, has killed so many people and has been rolled out again and again and again. And it's those two tenets, democracy and freedom, have basically become weaponized in the 21st century. So, as I say, I, ha I have to, um, I am shocked that the international community haven't sort of related these regime change t to this group of people. And if we're talking about imperialism on trial, I think that the neocons are central to um, um, imperialist moves. So not only did we have the, the countries in the Middle East um, that has, have um, been subjected to these uh, regime changes, but Venezuela has been on their list. And of course, Venezuela is, is in the news at the moment with a key neocon, John Bolton, right at the front. Then obviously Putin's Russia is very much in their sights. And to that end, we saw Victoria Newland, Newland wife of Robert Kagan, an arch neocon. Um, she was responsible for orchestrating the 2014 coup in Ukraine. That coup removed a democratically elected leader and destabilized a country right on Russia's border. There was a lot of intent in that. Um, so we find that the Washington neocons seem to sort of be able to maneuver to sort of various different political um, factions. First of all, they started off with, with Republicans, um, the US Republicans, with Bush and, um, and Blair's new labor in England. Um, that they uh, affected the Iraq war. Uh, with that relationship. But later, uh, they moved to US Democrats who have the, um, who, who do humanitarian interventionism and Hillary Clinton's responsibility to protect. These were two very useful mechanisms to put regime changes in power, uh, in, in place, make out that they are humanitarian interventions or that they're, their responsibility to uh, protect. It went away from the Republicans, which people were seeing more as very much, you know, um, warmongering and, and on the right. And it softened the whole thing to looking as if it was, a, you know, wanting um, ostensibly to, to protect the citizens and all this sort of thing. So Hillary uh, was a key driver in the Libya intervention, um, she, although the, the media, aligned media, very much made out that it was uh, Britain and France that were spearheading it, but actually it was Hillary who was driving it. Uh, WikiLeaks released 30,000 of her emails off her private server. 17,000 of those referred to Libya. She has uh, emails headed uh, TikTok, TikTok to Libya, and they detail strategies. It's sort of a, a counting down of strategies of how to undermine Gaddafi's Libya. So it's no wonder that when she heard of his brutal murder, she cackled and said, we came we saw he died. 
yeah, disgusting, absolutely disgusting. And, and as far as she was concerned, it was a job well done. Um, but Hillary, of late, has overextended herself, I'm very happy to say. Um, her lies with regard to the Russia Gate conspiracy theory are unravelling. Um, her DNC's malfeasance in undermining um, her running mate, her Democratic um, Party running mate, Bernie Sanders, at the primaries, was exposed in leaked, not hacked, but leaked emails. Her childish deflection from the expose of her and her DNC crimes um, was her contention that, ooh, Russia did it. Um, so this was very dangerous and led US politicians and aligned media to frame the supposed Russian hacking of her emails as an act of war. So she, rather than the, the mainstream media and analysts and looking at the content of the emails and exposing the malfeasance of, of what her, her DNC and she had done in the emails, like a, like a child, she just said, oh, Russia did it. And they all, they all turned to, okay, Russia did it. It's, it's so simplistic, infantile and stupid. Um, but that's what, uh, that's what we've um, come down to in, in today's political world. But what I think is that um, couldn't we logically assume that a DNC member who'd wanted Bernie Sanders uh, to be the Democratic presidential candidate and had perhaps witnessed some of the machinations of Hillary and her DNC team to undermine him, couldn't we assume that perhaps that disgruntled person might have downloaded the emails on site and pass them to a WikiLeaks contact, and that it was nothing to do with any uh, Russian hacking at all. I think that's probably quite a lot more of a plausible thing. <laughs> but as I say, Hillary's deceit in claiming Russian, Russia did it has been very dangerous. It has been cited as an act of, act of war, and it's pitted two nuclear superpowers against each other um, and a mainstream media has wholly colluded in this trumpeting her claim. Uh, so Hillary and her media trumps, uh, chums uh, stand, an, stand to lose an awful lot should Julian Assange reveal the source of uh, the, the emails to WikiLeaks and Assange quite clearly states it wasn't Russia. Sorry? Yes, yes. Well, that's another subject. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got to note as well that um, the level of desperation of the mainstream media in the last few weeks with their smears one after another brought out on Assange um, and I, since he's been arrested. And I think that's because they're worried and they're running scared and they're doubling down on their vilification of him. So you may think that I'm homing in on poor old Hillary quite a bit, which I am. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but she is just as a as legitimate target as Bush or Blair. Her lies with regard to Russian meddling were potentially as dangerous as theirs with regard to Iraq's WMDs. We have to thank Julian Assange and WikiLeaks for the near decade of work it has undertaken to give transparency to the machinations for preemptive wars of, of intervention and regime change. Journalist or not, publisher or not, Julian Assange is a truth teller and we need Julian Assange. <laughs>